This episode is going to look at life in ancient Sparta. We're going to explore its society, how it was organised, how it functioned and what it was like to be a Spartan. Sparta was a Greek city-state located in the Peloponnese, a mountainous region with pockets of fertile farmland between. The Spartan homeland was called Laconia and therefore they are often referred to as the Lacedaemonians. However, they also conquered the neighbouring region of Messenia, adding a considerably sized territory to their domain. And it was by the late Archaic period that Sparta had fully developed an exceptional militarised society with a unique political system, both admired and feared by other Greek city-states. The Spartan system contained three main political bodies, the kings, the Gerusii and the ephors. Under the government were three main classes, the Spartiates, the Perioikoi and the Helots. So, let's start with the kings. Sparta was unique. To begin with, it had not one, but two kings from two separate royal lines, the Aegeids and the Eropontids. The kings had a number of roles. The first was to perform religious duties. And to say that the Spartans were superstitious is putting it mildly. And so the kings would perform animal sacrifices before most important decisions, particularly in relation to war. The kings were also responsible for the donation of expensive gifts to the oracles of Delphi in order to receive one of their cryptic prophecies. Questions would be put to the oracles concerning matters of state, whether to go to war, to make peace and so on. However, the most important role the king could perform was to lead the Spartan army on campaign. The benefit of having two kings was that one could go to war whilst the second stayed at home. The kings also had the power to appoint messengers and diplomats to represent Sparta abroad. But most importantly, in political terms, the kings were members of the Gerusii. The Gerusii loosely translates to a council of elders and was the closest thing the Spartans had to a senate. It consisted of 28 members of accomplishment, around the age of 60 years or above, and it was also a position for life. As mentioned, the kings were also members, regardless of age. This brought the total number of members to 30. If Sparta had anything that could be described as the elite of its society, then the Gerusii was it. It was the most powerful body within the Spartan state. Next, we have the ephors. In total, there were five at a time, selected for a one-year term every year. The only criteria was that an ephor had to be at least 45 years of age and could only serve once in their lifetime. Other than that, these were common Spartan citizens, given this prestigious position. The Greek word ephor loosely translates to the overseers. So, what did they oversee? Well, first and foremost, they oversaw the kings. When the king led the army, two ephors would accompany him. On campaign, the king had life and death powers over his men and dictated all the decisions. These two ephors would assess the king's performance and his behaviour. Once the campaign was over and the army had returned home, the two returning ephors would report back to the remaining three. In Sparta, the ephors had the power to bring charges to a king. This would be decided by a vote between themselves. A vote of three or more would allow them to prosecute and a trial would begin. However, the jury would consist of the Gerusii and the ephors combined. And remember, the kings were members of the Gerusii, and therefore the kings would be part of the jury, including the one being prosecuted. The ephors also had a second important role, to think up political policy and write legislation. Again, a vote between them would allow the legislation to go before an assembly, attended by Spartan citizens. The Spartans would shout for or against the motion, and it was allowed a shout that won. However, despite this, the Gerusii still held the political power. As they set the agenda for the assembly, they could prevent the vote from taking place, and the legislation would be dead in the water. When the Ephor's one-year term was up, their performance in office was scrutinised and assessed by their replacements, and they themselves could potentially face prosecution. 
So, let's look at the Spartan class system, starting with the Spartiates. The Spartiates were all male adult citizens. They would have first have to have passed the Agogi. This was the tough Spartan state education system designed to turn boys into soldiers. To be a Spartan citizen was to be in the Spartan army. All Spartiates were full-time soldiers and their entire lives was based on military training and preparation for war. It was the Spartiates that formed the Spartan Assembly, allowing them to have their say in the political system. The Spartiates would also have the opportunity to serve as an ephor or even potentially the Gerusii. Next we have the Pyrrhokoi. They were a diverse bunch. They were craftsmen, tradespeople, farmers and fishermen. They manufactured equipment, tools, clothing, weapons, armour or even boats, as well as produced food, you know, normal stuff, working class people. They tended to live outside Sparta, but within Laconia, in the outer villages and towns that had come under Spartan influence early on in its history. They were free men and could own their own property and ran their own affairs. If needed, they could be called upon for military service. However, they were not regarded as Spartan citizens, nor could they ever become one. This meant that despite their freedoms, they had no political rights. At the bottom of Spartan society were the Helots. The Helots' lot in life was a tragic one. They were slaves. Also known as the Messenians, they had been conquered and enslaved by the Spartans. However, they were tied to the land and could not be bought or sold like slaves elsewhere. Their role was to work the fields and they produced the bulk of the grain to support the Spartan state. Messenia had been conquered after a long hard fought war and a second equally hard conflict caused by a slave rebellion. To make things worse, the population of the Helots immensely outnumbered the Spartans themselves. As a result, they were brutally oppressed by their Spartan masters out of fear of another uprising. In fact, when entering office, the ephors would officially renew a declaration of war against the Helots every year. So, let's take a look at life in Sparta. Growing up in Sparta was difficult. Ultimately, the child's future was decided by the state. Once born, a Spartan baby would be inspected by an elder. If the baby was too puny or deformed in any way, it would be abandoned on Mount Tegetus, called the Place of Rejection. The Spartan state believed it was better to die than live weak. Once this trial was over, the child would then live at home with its mother. However, even at this early age, the mothers did the best that they could to toughen the babies up in order to prepare them for the challenges ahead. Babies like to be swaddled and wrapped up tight and is often done to stop them crying. However, this was not done in Sparta. The idea was to start strengthening their arms and legs straight away, as well as to teach them not to cry and whimper. Newborn babies were bathed in wine. It was believed that sickly babies were thrown into convulsions by this and the strong tempered by the experience. They were taught not to be fussy with their food and not to be afraid of the dark. At the age of seven, the boys were taken from their homes to enter an intense military training regime known as the Agogi. This was the ultimate boot camp. They remained barefoot to toughen their feet and were issued one cloak annually. This was all they had to wear during both summer and winter, which could be bitterly cold in the Peloponnese. They slept on beds made from the tips of reeds, which they collected themselves. They were taught to fight and were pitted against one another and endured physical training which increased in intensity as they got older. The rations were meagre in order to encourage them to sneak off, live off the land and steal food. If caught, they were punished, not for stealing but for getting caught. They learnt just enough reading and writing to get by, but the vast majority of the training was based on enduring the hardships and preparation for war. The Agogi was designed to turn small boys into the ancient world's most elite soldiers. By the age of about 20, Spartan males could move on from the Agogi. At this time, they became members of a common mess, but only via election by existing members. From then on, they would continue to have their meals at these messes. It was the ultimate boys club. Spartans had a balanced, nutritious diet. 
They did not eat or drink alcohol to excess. However, on the daily menu was the infamous Spartan black broth, which was basically pig's blood, salt and vinegar, an acquired taste I'm sure. It was also around this age that young Spartans would be paired with a much older mentor to pass on his experience, which was described as a close, lifelong friendship. Now, there has been some debate among historians as to the exact nature of this relationship. However, I think the point of it was to retain an old-fashioned conservative influence over the next generation. The Spartan system was all about staying the same. They didn't want new ideas changing anything. Those that stood out and showed particular promise could be selected to join the 300 strong King's Bodyguard, known as the Hippies. This was a prestigious position and competition for this role was intense. Others may have been selected to join the Cryptia. This was a service designed to keep the Helots oppressed. They would be dispatched into the countryside equipped with daggers and basic rations. They would lay low by day and at night they would roam about single out to Helot and for whatever reason, murder him. Successful completion of the Agogi meant full Spartan citizenship, of which they were awarded civic lands and Helot slaves to farm them. Failure meant dishonour and exclusion from Spartan society. It was also around this age that a Spartan would be expected to marry. The wedding ceremony in Sparta was a strange one. The bride would shave her head wear a male's cloak and remain alone in a darkened room. The groom would then enter the room, consummate the marriage and afterwards he would simply go back to the rest of the men, job done. Men were not permitted to live at home with their wives until around about the age of 30. Until that time they continued to live in dorms with other men and so this sneaking back and forth to visit their wives continued. Men's role in Spartan society was very clearly defined. They were first and foremost soldiers. But what of the women? What was their role? With the men occupied with military affairs, it was a woman's role to manage the family income produced from the family lands, a role that was performed exclusively by men in other Greek city-states. However, a woman's role first and foremost was to marry and produce children, the next generation of Spartans. Failure to do this was considered a failure of duty to the state. In fact, producing children was so important in Spartan society that it was considered honourable to allow your wife to sleep with another man if you thought the union would produce suitable offspring for the state. Any notion of jealousy in such matters was scoffed at. It is also worth noting that as men and women lived largely separate lives, same-sex affairs were more than frequent for both males and females in Spartan society. The Spartan belief was that physically fit women produced physically fit children and therefore women were encouraged from an early age to eat healthy and exercise regularly. They took part in sports such as running, wrestling, discus and javelin and even rode horses. Again, these activities were exclusively enjoyed by men in other Greek city-states. Another rare quality about the Spartan system was that it eliminated luxury. Ornaments, decoration, extravagance were all forbidden. Instead, all households were kept simple and plain. There were even regulations to how big your table could be, for example. And there was also a ban on moustaches. To keep Sparta isolated and free from temptation, gold and silver coins were abolished. Instead, iron bars were used as currency, which were worthless outside Sparta. Therefore, traders avoided Sparta and the Spartans themselves couldn't buy from traders. Wealth was therefore generally accumulated in food produce, livestock and land. And although it was possible to be more wealthier than your fellow Spartan, it was exceedingly difficult to display that wealth. Even dogs and horses were considered communal property. When a husband died, his public land was given back to the state, but his private land was inherited by his wife, not his sons like elsewhere. Therefore, women could accumulate large amounts of land if they kept remarrying and becoming widows. As a result, there was a number of very wealthy women in Sparta. Spartan politics and society was ultra-conservative and stubbornly resisted change of any kind. 
The political system was set up in such a way that no man could accumulate enough power to rise to any position resembling a tyranny. While Spartan society was a military system designed to produce the finest soldiers in the ancient world. So embedded was this in the Spartan mindset that the Spartans believed the greatest achievement they could attain in their lifetime was to die for the state. Thank you for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.